Our speakers for today, Dr. Stanley Turham, who's Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs in the Department of Neurology, and Dr. Christopher uh, Kellner, who's uh, one of our up-and-coming young uh, neurologic surgeons here that uh, rescued a, a couple of my patients in the past year and uh, bring us up to date on how we should respond to the acute, acute stroke syndrome. And I'm sure we'll have some questions, particularly uh, in the setting of immediately post open heart surgery, which is where we see it most often. Uh, so we, I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Dr. Turham to tee things up, and then Chris will follow that up with the surgical side. Stan, thank you so much for being here. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, everything except <clears throat> endovascular interventions, which probably are of the greatest relevance uh, to you folks, but uh, Chris is going to take care of that in just a few minutes. So um, stroke is a big deal. There are about 5 million stroke deaths each year. It costs greater than... Um, <clears throat> $3 billion nationwide, um, and about one in five survivors suffer another stroke within five years. Um, now, of course, when we talk about stroke, it's uh, really a heterogeneous group of uh, conditions, uh, basically all involving the blood vessel. Um, ischemic strokes account for the bulk of them, and of those, uh, we can talk about uh, small vessel disease, large vessel uh, occlusions, cardioembolic strokes, cryptogenic strokes, and then about 10% zebras. Uh, the remaining strokes are hemorrhagic, uh, broken down roughly into uh, three quarters intracere intracerebral hemorrhage and another quarter subarachnoid hemorrhage. We're really not going to discuss those um, today. Uh, the risk factors are things that you're probably familiar with. By far the most important is a uh, major modifiable risk factor. Uh, is hypertension. Um, there's a clear epidemiologic link between blood pressure levels and the incidence of primary stroke. Uh, this is a uh, graph from the data from seven prospective observational studies that demonstrates the linear relationship between um, diastolic blood pressure and um, nearly half a million individuals with a history of uh, MI or stroke in 10 year, without a history of stroke <clears throat> or MI uh, during a 10 year follow up period. Um, and as you can see, the um, diastolic blood pressure uh, goes down well below uh, what we consider to be the upper limit of normal, um, so that the linear relationship um, seems to continue throughout um, the, me the measurable uh, blood pressure range. In terms of um, recurrent stroke, the same thing applies. Um, in uh, this study of almost 2,500 individuals with a, with a history of TIA or minor stroke, again, there's a linear relationship uh, between usual blood pressure and usual um, either diastolic or uh, systolic blood pressure and the risk of a secondary stroke. Um, and indeed, a randomized trial um, taking people whose blood pressure was already reasonably well controlled, who had had either an ischemic stroke or intracerebral hemorrhage, um, and demonstrated that by decreasing the blood pressure by approximately 9 over 4, um, beyond <clears throat> where they already were, uh, there was a substantial risk reduction, really comparable to the effect of, say, aspirin on the prevention of stroke. Um, and again, there was no lower limit. So I guess. What I want to emphasize is that unlike MI, there's really no evidence at all uh, for there being any kind of a J-shaped curve with regard to um, prevention of either ischemic or intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, and so how far down can we go? We really don't know the answer. Basically, it's a question of symptoms and, and the patient tolerating uh, the blood pressure. Um, as you uh, may be aware there are a couple of very large trials both here and in Europe of treating asymptomatic carotid stenosis with endarterectomy and they demonstrated that um, over a 10-year period you roughly uh, reduce the risk of stroke from 2% um, per year to 1% per year. Um, and so we um, started doing uh, interventions for asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Uh, 
Um, but what has changed over the last um, 10 or 20 years is the way in which we treat asymptomatic individuals. Uh, we control blood pressure to a, a greater extent. We use uh, statins fairly freely. Uh, many people are on um, aspirin or other prophylaxis, whether they're uh, symptomatic or not. Uh, and the result is that in these various trials, looking at the um, uh, control population, we see that the incidence of ischemic stroke in patients who have asymptomatic carotid stenosis can be estimated to be well under 1% per year, which has raised the question, uh, is it still beneficial to go ahead and fix um, something which may or may not be broken? And hence, CREST-2. And this is the uh, brief digression and advertisement for a trial that we're about to start doing here. Um, CREST-2 is uh, essentially two trials. Um, one trial will test the hypothesis that intensive medical management plus um, carotid endarterectomy is better than um, just intensive medical management in preventing stroke in patients with high-grade asymptomatic stenosis. And the other trial is essentially the same thing, but with carotid stenting. As you may be aware, um, trials to date really haven't uh, demonstrated much of a difference in terms of the long-term outcomes, whether one does stenting or endarterectomy. Now, there may be certain candidates that are better for one than the other, but that's a subject for another day. The bottom line is that we just don't know at this point whether we should or shouldn't be uh, intervening on these people. And CREST-2, which is a nationwide study that's being run out of the Mayo Clinic, um, is uh, hopefully going to answer that question. So I would encourage all of you to um, refer patients to that trial if you have asymptomatic patients with significant carotid stenosis. OK. Back from the commercial break. Um, acute ischemic stroke treatment. Time is brain. You've heard that before. And of course, treatment begins with recognition. And in recent years, we've uh, adapted from the uh, FAST algorithm to the BFAST algorithm. Um, and um, what those initials stand for are balance, so loss of balance or dizziness, difficulty walking. Um, eyes is probably not the correct term, but BFAST sounds a lot better than putting a V in there for vision. I wouldn't know how to pronounce that. Um, but really, it refers to either diplopia, double vision, or vision loss, either to one side, as in hemianopia, uh, or in one eye, um, uh, transiently as in amaurosis, um, or in the case of stroke, um, more lasting. Uh, and I don't know if Chris is going to get into what they're able to do now in terms of um, ischemia to the eye, but um, there are interventions that apply actually to uh, problems with the ophthalmic artery as well. Um, face is um, for a facial droop, uh, un an even numbness, or an uneven smile. Um, a is for arm and leg, and weakness on one side of the body um, is what that stands for. And then speech, whether it's slurred speech or difficulty with language, either speaking or understanding what's being said. And then finally, um, T is for time, and that's both time as in um, the faster we get to people, the more we're able to do, but also to note the time that the symptoms have begun. Often the person who first recognizes the stroke um, is in the best position to know when the stroke began. And uh, for now, most of what we choose to do is time-based. But as we'll discuss in a few minutes, uh, we're trying to move to a more tissue-based um, algorithm for understanding who is best to intervene upon. So the bottom line is that be fast uh, is something that uh, is both um, an admonition and an acronym. And um, I think it's important to recognize the symptoms and signs of a stroke and also what to do about it. So here at Mount Sinai, for um, in-hospital strokes, we've uh, established a, a fairly easy way to alert uh, the stroke team and the various uh, people involved in acute stroke interventions, and that's to simply dial five threes. So extension three, 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 three uh, will generate um, 
a series of events that um, culminate in the stroke code. Um, and various benchmarks have been established by the Department of Health, by the Joint Commission, uh, American Heart Association, um, with the idea of essentially um, providing IV TPA within an hour of the recognition of a stroke. Um, these are specific benchmarks for um, the emergency department, but the same thing applies to in-hospital stroke. Um, and I'm happy to say that our average time um, from either presentation to the ED or recognition on the floor is uh, just under um, the magic 60 minutes or the golden hour. Um, and what are we trying to do? Well, basically, we're trying to save the ischemic penumbra. So if you have a clot, and we'll talk more about clots in that particular location, uh, but this is true for clots that uh, involve large arteries or, for that matter, smaller ones, um, there is an area of uh, stunned but salvageable tissue that may be considerably larger than the core infarct, um, which may, in fact, uh, be irreversibly damaged within minutes. Um, the uh, penumbra, on the other hand, uh, may survive from minutes to several hours to, um, in occasional circumstances, uh, beyond a day. And that's really the target of what we're trying to do with all interventions. Um, so I think you're all familiar with intravenous TPA. It was approved about 20 years ago um, after the NINDS uh, trial. And uh, that was sort of a historic trial because it was the first trial that demonstrated that it was possible to intervene in acute ischemic stroke and actually demonstrate um, a positive result. Um, the primary endpoint was a um, global odds ratio for a favorable outcome um, at three months after stroke, and that odds ratio turned out to be about two. Um, in addition, there were various individual functional measures of uh, outcome, including uh, global disability, um, activities of daily living, and measures of neurologic deficits, all of which uh, were positive. And perhaps most importantly, the benefit was long-lasting. Uh, the same uh, differences persisted a year after the stroke. So people, in fact, don't necessarily recover after that initial insult to the same degree if you don't administer uh, IV TPA in a timely manner. Um, now, of course, it's not without risk. About 6% of the people treated with intravenous um, TPA, in fact, um, hemorrhage. And that was about 10 times uh, the rate in uh, those who were not given IV TPA. But there was no increase in mortality overall. Um, and indeed, uh, if anything, there was a decrease in mortality, but that was not statistically significant. It's important to remember that, this, that IV TPA is true for any particular stroke subtype, whether we're talking about small vessel, large vessel, embolic, uh, or um, stroke of unknown etiology and roughly with the same degree of benefit. Um, subsequent to that initial landmark study, there were a number of other trials um, enrolling people within uh, three hours of onset, um, done here and in Europe, and they all demonstrated essentially the same result. Um, and um, the, the subtleties of the uh, design's uh, differences don't really matter. Um, but it was uh, within 10 years, I think, confirmed that uh, there was clearly a benefit in intravenous uh, TPA use um, in acute ischemic stroke. Um, the other thing that came out of these uh, first 10 years of experience was that the risk of hemorrhage was higher with any kind of protocol violation. Um, but other than that, it was just as effective in uh, community use as within clinical trials. And in addition, um, some of the off-label uses, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, also conferred a benefit over not treating. Um, and then came something called ECAS-3 that looked at the benefit from three to four and a half hours from onset. And essentially, this was this, a similar trial to the earlier studies within three hours um, with certain additional exclusions. So it didn't include people uh, over 80, didn't include very severe strokes, 
as demonstrated by an NIH stroke scale score greater than 25. If you were taking oral anticoagulants, regardless of your uh, immediate history, um, you were not eligible. So it was a, a somewhat uh, smaller uh, cohort, if you will. Um, and the benefit, in fact, turned out to be statistically significant, although not to the same extent um, as those treated within three hours. And to this day, um, the FDA has not actually approved uh, the use beyond three hours. So the package insert hasn't actually changed in that regard. Um, it has changed in other regards, and we'll get to that in a minute. So as of about five years ago, only about 7% of acute ischemic stroke patients uh, actually received IV TPA. And therefore, there have been various attempts to try to expand that time window. Um, Education has played an important role. If people recognize the signs and symptoms of a stroke, uh, they're more likely to, to uh, seek attention, obviously. Um, unlike uh, myocardial infarction, strokes don't hurt. Um, and indeed, in right hemisphere strokes, one of the uh, consequences is often the failure to recognize a disease process. Um, and so it becomes that much harder for people to get to the hospital on time. Um, nevertheless, community education efforts have seemed to have played a role in increasing the number of people who get to the hospital within three hours. Um, one attempt to actually start treatment in the field uh, with at least a neuroprotective agent with the idea of expanding the overall time window um, <coughs> did not produce positive results, but what it did do was demonstrate that it is possible to do uh, clinical trials beginning um, as soon as the patient is recognized in the field as having a stroke. And indeed, one of the things that um, is now beginning to come into play is the idea of mobile stroke units with CT scanners actually in the ambulance. Um, but the bottom line is what we're looking to do is expand uh, the number of people who can be treated, including uh, expanding the eligibility criteria. Um, so here's a list of the people who could be treated with IV TPA, and this is probably familiar um, to most of you. Um, the things in which where you, that are followed by an asterisk are things that, in fact, um, have changed. Um, and uh, that has resulted, I think, in an, in an increased number of people. So we no longer um, uh, wait, for example, for an INR to come back unless it's somebody in whom we suspect uh, there may be a problem with coagulation. Um, rather, we begin the uh, infusion, and in the event that we're surprised when the result eventually does filter back, uh, we can always stop the infusion. Uh, similarly, if we don't suspect a platelet count uh, to be a problem, we'll start and then stop if it turns out that uh, somebody has thrombocytopenia. Um, similarly, uh, if there is um, a seizure at onset, uh, that doesn't immediately preclude treating people with IV TPA um, as long as we're sure that the patient is, in fact, suffering from an ischemic stroke. Um, perhaps the most important thing here is the blood pressure. Um, we know that if the blood pressure is greater than 185 over 110, that there's an increased risk of hemorrhage. And so that's one uh, criterion that we uh, stick to, uh, although it's certainly possible to lower the blood pressure and then treat. Um, and then finally, here in red, it's important that the family uh, or the patient, if the patient is capable of understanding, uh, understand the potential risks and benefits from treatment. However, we do not require uh, informed consent to be signed. Uh, it's been demonstrated that that is um, something which actually delays treatment. And at Mount Sinai, we've never required that. Um, and if one thinks about it, since it's the only FDA-approved treatment for acute ischemic stroke, it um, would seem to make sense that one doesn't necessarily need um, informed consent. Nevertheless, it's important to educate whoever is available that could understand about just what's going on. OK. Um, now, um, additional characteristics which have evolved. Um, and so what's sort of grayed out here are things which used to preclude giving IV TPA that no longer do, uh, at least not absolutely. These are all things that one needs to be cautious about um, 
and that includes no major surgery in the previous 14 days. So uh, it's a question of weighing risks and benefits uh, with regard to things like GI or urinary tract bleeding, um, head trauma, MI in the previous three months, and so on. Um, none of these uh, currently represent uh, absolute contraindications. Um, and in another um, aspect of things, um, the things in red, neurologic signs not clearing spontaneously, neurologic signs um, not minor or isolated, uh, are no longer necessarily uh, contraindications. And the reason for that is it turns out that folks uh, in this situation don't necessarily have as good an outcome as we initially anticipated. Indeed, roughly a third of these people wind up with um, significant neurologic impairment at the time of discharge. Um, as I mentioned, um, time to treatment is a very important factor, and we can see that here um, looking at a um, meta-analysis of over 3,000 patients in each group um, where the um, odds ratio um, actually approaches one as we get to greater than four and a half hours. So clearly, if we can treat people um, within three hours, we're certainly going to be doing better than if we do it in less than four, uh, between three and four and a half, uh, although there's still a benefit. But beyond that, unless we use some techniques for um, enriching the pool, if you will, of people who are more likely to benefit, uh, we fail to see a benefit. Um, conversely, there really isn't much of a difference between those over 80 and those under 80, and indeed we've treated people uh, over 100. Um, and all data suggests that the benefit um, is about as great in the elderly um, as in those younger, although their overall outcomes may not be as good. Um, and similarly, with the um, severity of the stroke, there does not seem to be um, a significant difference, including those with the very minor strokes. That is, um, NIH stroke scale score is less than five. Um, and so, uh, what do we mean by mild or rapidly improving symptoms? Um, that can certainly include people that have isolated deficits that may, in fact, be potentially disabling. Uh, hemianopia or an aphasia doesn't get you um, very many points on the NIH stroke scale, but obviously um, can be uh, catastrophic. Um, and so we've increased uh, our, um, the likelihood that we're going to treat people even with these isolated deficits. Now, there was an ongoing trial uh, called PRISMS, looking specifically at people with less than or equal to an NIH stroke scale score of five, um, who could be randomized to see if this benefit um, actually exists, as opposed to um, a suggestion from various meta-analyses. However, the, uh, the recruitment was literally just halted last month, uh, essentially because um, the recruitment was going so slowly that um, Genentech really, I think, didn't want to foot the bill any longer. We'll see what results we get once the follow-up is completed. Um, but the number of patients accrued was actually only about half of what was originally intended. And I think one of the reasons why um, recruitment went so slowly nationwide is because most people um, have no longer uh, display equipoise with regard to whether it's beneficial or not. Um, and I think the, the trend is certainly toward treating people. And one of the reasons for that is that the, uh, the risk, if you will, in very minor stroke is uh, thought to be substantially less. Um, so just to reiterate, um, last year the uh, American Heart, American Stroke Association came out with um, a very large paper examining all of the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And as a result of that, um, we revised our acute stroke protocol here at Mount Sinai. Um, so that witness seizure, um, an elevated or uh, severely depressed blood glucose, rapidly resolving neurologic deficits, um, or mild stroke, uh, were no longer uh, absolute contraindications. And similarly, with major surgery or a lumbar puncture or an arterial puncture uh, in the uh, previous week, uh, were no longer absolute contraindications. And then in the three to four and a half hour window, uh, we removed the uh, exclusions that were present um, in that uh, sort of pivotal trial, if you will, uh, so that a physician can uh, 
use his or her judgment with regard to whether the patient is likely to benefit. The other aspect of this is the notion of expanding the time window by looking not just at the time, uh, but at some sort of a tissue-based clot. And what that involves is looking at the penumbra and deciding whether uh, people are likely to benefit or not. Um, and this includes uh, people with acute stroke where the t we know that the time is beyond four and a half hours, or people who wake up with a stroke where we by um, definition have said that the stroke occurs when they were last known well, in other words, the time that they went to sleep. Uh, but obviously all strokes don't occur the moment that your head hits the pillow, and indeed probably most of them occur much closer to when you awaken. Um, nevertheless, that's been the uh, rubric that we've used. And what we're trying to do is look to see how much of the tissue is irre irreversibly damaged versus uh, salvageable. And one way to do this is with a diffusion-perfusion mismatch on MR. You can do the same thing with CT um, perfusion. And indeed, uh, by and large, at this institution, we use CT perfusion. But this is an illustration of how it would look with um, MR, the idea being that we can um, salvage the tissue that is um, underperfused but not uh, clearly infarcted. Now, there have been a number of trials that have looked at MR perfusion diffusion mismatches using um, IV TPA or uh, similar drugs um, that, at least to date, have failed to show a benefit or else are ongoing. Um, similarly, with wake up strokes, um, two trials there, um, both of which are uh, still ongoing, looking at the idea of within nine hours enrolling people who have. Um, a significant penumbral pattern. And that actually represents about 20% of all strokes. So we're talking about a substantial number of people, um, including people here in the hospital, um, obviously. So the uh, directions for future research include using um, more selective fibrinolytics, uh, which presumably would be safer, uh, and using a combination of treatments, uh, thrombolytics with uh, either a GP2B3A inhibitor um, ultrasound to enhance the effect, or a combination of thrombolytic and um, neuroprotection. Uh, to date, all of the neuroprotection trials have been uh, disappointing, um, but uh, we're still hoping that there will be a way to extend the window with the appropriate neuroprotective agents, including perhaps hypothermia. Um, okay, so. Um, Moving on to something that may be a little bit more relevant to most of the patients that you see, um, namely those who have large vessel occlusions and who can, can or in many instances cannot receive intravenous thrombolytic therapy. There are a number of vessels that are um, potentially uh, amenable to this. We talk about large vessel occlusions. We're talking about the internal carotid depicted here with the red dot, um, the middle cerebral, either in the uh, most proximal portion, the M1, or in some instances, the M2, uh, the initial branches. Um, the anterior cerebral artery, um, and perhaps even uh, more distally in the anterior cerebral, and then certainly the basilar. Although there are no studies as yet in terms of randomized trials, that, this is perhaps the area where um, the most uh, dramatic results can be obtained. Um, and in all instances, the idea is to extract the clot within whatever the appropriate time window is, uh, and we as yet do not know exactly what that is. And what's made this possible has been the evolution of the technology. And so we started out basically squirting some thrombolytic um, at the site of the clot. Um, and there was actually a positive trial of that with a drug called prourokinase, which is not currently available, um, into the middle cerebral artery. And then various versions of things uh, using ultrasound, using uh, a coil retriever that essentially worked the way a corkscrew did, does, um, and then various other aspiration techniques and retrieval techniques until the current um, versions um, were developed, um, which made a huge difference. I'm in my first year out of training. When I was in residency, only in 2013, I was, at, I was deciding what subspecialty I was going to go into, and everyone was telling me not to go into endovascular because two, three stroke trials had just failed, trials that were comparing endovascular therapy to IVTPA, 
had come up with no benefit. So everyone was saying stroke's not going to be treated endovascularly. Other disease processes, they are, it's too crowded. It's not something to go into. So um, <clears throat> I guess against their uh, better opinion, I, I went into endovascular. And I'm really glad I did because right when I started fellowship in 2015, a bunch of trials came out positive. So I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that and, uh, and why this is relevant to you guys because this dramatically increased the number of patients uh, we could potentially treat with stroke. As you saw from one of Dr. Turham's slides, um, only 7% of patients in 2011 were getting IV TPA. So it was dramatically increased the number that we can treat. And now we can treat patients who have just had surgery and maybe we can even treat patients who have had long surgeries and are waking up after maybe 10 hours or so, suddenly you find a symptom. And now there are some ways, as Dr. Turin was mentioning, that we can do some scans and see if they have some salvageable tissue. Let's see if I can go forward here. So when I was a medical student back in 2006, I read this article and I think it's one of the best articles I've, I've read and it was one of the things that motivated me to go into neurosurgery. And it was <clears throat> kind of a playful article trying to quantify the number of neurons that are lost per minute in a stroke. So this very famous neurologist, Dr. Saver, um, calculated that strokes take about 10 hours and the total average volume of, of most strokes and how many neurons are in each milliliter of brain. They came up with these numbers here, 2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, seven and a half miles of myelin myelinated fibers are lost every minute in a stroke. So in 2013, as I mentioned, there were a bunch of negative trials. Um, there's kind of a, <clears throat> it's kind of a downer. Everyone was thinking this wasn't going to work out, but everyone knew it was going to work out. Um, eventually, everyone had a feeling that this is the right thing. It seems like it makes sense. You're pulling out the clot and you're reperfusing the brain. Why isn't it working? And we had to really address what those issues were. So I was trying to think of a good metaphor for snatching <clears throat> victory from the clutches of defeat. And being from Boston, I could only come up with one uh, ideal metaphor here. So 2015, then <clears throat> there was this one trial in January that came out called the Mr. Clean trial. And then when that came out, there were four others that were in progress and had to stop the trial because they no longer had equipoise. And all of those four also were positive even though they were interim analyses. <clears throat> so here are those trials, the Mr. Clean trial, and then here are the four others that were slight variations but very similar. I'll go through some of those details. <clears throat> the Mr. Clean trial was, was multi-center, 500 patients. And the thing that was different about this trial is you had to have imaging confirmation that there was a clot that you thought you could go after. So it was about patient selection. Patients were randomized to getting the usual treatment, which was IVTPA if they were eligible, or getting uh, endovascular therapy. And the time window was also important. And this, was, this, this trial was done entirely in the Netherlands. And so they had a system that they could command the system. And this was the first trial to have a low, even two, 260 minutes as the average onset to groin puncture is pretty high by today's standards. But back then, all the, all the 2013 trials were much longer than that. So people started to get the systems in place that allowed this to work. Um, and then stent retriever. The 81% of patients were treated with a stent retriever, and that was much more effective than the prior methods, which I'll show you some of those things. So this is a story about systems improvement, and it's a story about device improvement. <clears throat> we use the TICI scale. This is the thrombolysis and cerebral infarction scale to grade how well we're doing on angiogram during the case. You pull out the clot and then take a picture and see how well the brain is reperfused. 2B is 50% to 100% to 99% of the previously blocked area is now reperfused. So <clears throat> that's actually, by today's standards, not that great. You want more than 50% of what was blocked to be perfused. But that was still how, um, how a benefit, how a positive result was, was evaluated, even in, as recent as 2015. Here are the clinical outcomes from those trials that I mentioned. Um, so you can see this is a neurologic scale called the modified Rankin scale. And if a patient is a zero, they are perfectly fine. If a patient is zero or two, we say they had a good outcome and they're pretty much independent in their, in their function. 
So you can see in the blue at the end of vascular treatment in the Mr. Clean trial, is this a laser pointer? Maybe not. <clears throat> um, so you can see in the Mr. Clean trial, the percentage of patients who um, at this time point of six months were independent was about twice as many as the patients who just got IVTPA. And then if you look through the other trials, you see that the odds ratio is somewhere close to two in terms of the likelihood of having a positive uh, result and being independent. So the number needed to treat from these final three trials was only three to four, which is a very powerful effect. And then when a meta-analysis was done later, the number needed to treat, if you take all these patients, was only 2.6. Here we're seeing that patients um, who, these, as the trials, some of the trials that were published in 2015 had very low symptom onset to reperfusion time. And we could see that the patients, the, the trials that had lower onset to reperfusion time, a uh, higher percentage of patients did well. So it just lets us know that time is important, which we already knew. <clears throat> so these are the reasons why those trials succeeded. Patient selection, like I mentioned, uh, we started getting CTAs, CT angiogram, and the brain really shows you where the clot is. So it had, the clot has to be in a place you can get to, which is characterized as a large vessel, which is either the ICA or the M1. We, we were doing a better job. Uh, we were using stent retrievers. We were getting TICI 2 b or 3 in 58 to 88%. In 2013, we were only getting it in 45% of, pa of patients. And then we were getting them to the cath lab faster. Here's a quick device development set of slides. Early on, it was kind of like you're at the carnival and you're trying to grab something from uh, some, some teddy bear or something. It didn't really work too well. Um, and then in 2004, the Mercy device came out. That was like a corkscrew. You would try to poke the clot with the corkscrew and try and pull it back. That worked occasionally. And then in 2008, we would put up a suction catheter, put the suction catheter in the back of the clot, and then poke the clot and try and break it up so that it could get aspirated into the suction catheter. That worked occasionally, but those procedures took a really long time, and you ended up with a lot of small pieces further out where you couldn't get to them. Then in 2012, there's this device called the stent retriever, stent retriever, which was accidentally discovered when people were trying to stent open clots and see if you could reperfuse just by stenting. And then what, some of the stents get stuck sometimes. They don't deploy properly. They accidentally have to pull them out just to get them out of the head of the animals they were um, practicing in. And uh, they were finding that they were getting the whole clot by doing that. So, <clears throat> and uh, one of our professors here, Dr. Ma Jay Mako, was involved in those animal studies um, at Buffalo. And then, <clears throat> and then now there are second generation stent retrievers coming out. These are being tested now. We're doing a trial called the Neuravi trial to test subtle variations to see if maybe you can grab the clot more effectively. And that on the right. And then this device <clears throat> is something that some people in our department are also involved in the creation of, where you use the stent retriever, and as you're pulling the stent retriever back, it kind of rolls a cocoon around it so that pieces can't break off as you're pulling it back down into the guide catheter in the neck. Here's a video of how the stent retriever works. I took this off the internet, but I think it'll work out. I deleted the cheesy music. So we've got a guide catheter in the internal carotid artery right at the petrous junction. A micro <clears throat> wire goes through the clot. Sometimes you can break up some of the clot and it goes further and so you can't get it if that happens. Um, but most of the time that doesn't happen. Then you put a micro catheter through the clot also. You bring up the stent through the micro catheter and then you pull the micro catheter back. The stent deploys through the clot. You let it sit for about five minutes and let the clot intercalate into the walls of the stent. And then you pull everything back into the guide catheter. Sometimes pieces break off. Sometimes you don't get the whole thing. But most of the time, you do get it. So these trials actually changed the guidelines. There was a guideline amendment recently. And the exciting thing is that <clears throat> well, some of the details that are important uh, for you guys as you're deciding is this something that could potentially, is this a patient who could potentially benefit from this? Um, the stroke scale, a patient has to have a six or worse, which means some symptoms, 
they have to have some symptoms. They have to merit the risk of the procedure, which is a 5% risk of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which is <clears throat> pretty similar to IVTPA. Um, so they have to have a few deficits to, to really benefit. And you, if you have a stroke scale of six, if you have a stroke scale less than six, you're probably not going to have a large vessel occlusion anyways. Um, and the, the clot has to be in the ICA or the MCA, in the guidelines. But now we're doing it in a lot more places outside of the guidelines, and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. So <clears throat> this is the, so the, everything I mentioned there are the new recommendations that are class one recommendations. And then there's some other class two recommendations. I won't go into those details, but I'll show you a few uh, case studies to illustrate what we're doing. Um, so case one is a 59-year-old woman. She has AFib, but she wasn't on anticoagulation. She had a sudden onset of aphasia, right-sided weakness, and some hemianopsia it makes you think that the clot is probably in the left M1, or maybe in the left ICA, blocking flow to the left hemisphere. She had a stroke scale of 14, which is moderate. It's greater than six. It's definitely something that we could, enroll, we could treat. Um, and then on the CT, we actually see something called the dense MCA sign, which on a regular CT, not an angiogram, you can see this right here, and that's, that's the clot. And some, you see that once in a while on the CT. And um, this patient was eligible for TPA, so got TPA. If the patient's eligible for TPA, we give TPA right in the scanner and then do the CTA. If the patient's not eligible for, CT, for a TPA for whatever reason, then we do the CT and the CTA right at the same time. So <clears throat> that patient had a blockage, went to uh, the angio suite, and here's a left carotid injection. And you can see here the contralateral side is filling well, um, and then you see a blockage right there in the left M1. This is a stent retriever. Sorry, I can't go back, so I can't show you, but that, <clears throat> there you go. Here you can see the stent retriever deployed in the artery right there. And then right when you deploy it, there's perfusion is restored through the stent. But then you have to wait five minutes and pull it back. So here you can see that's now normal. <clears throat> and then the, sometimes there will be a small stroke. The clot was in an area where there are perforators to the basal ganglia here. And the basal ganglia usually suffers from ischemia a little bit earlier than the cortex. So you still see a small uh, stroke here, but much better than she probably would have had if uh, did not have that removed. She improved significantly. Sometimes you see improvement right away. Sometimes you see improvement over multiple days. Um, but it's, it's always very satisfying when they <clears throat> are unconscious on the table, but then suddenly wake up and start trying to get up. So <clears throat> after a 30 day follow up, her NIH stroke scale was only a one. She had subtle word finding difficulties in English, which was not her native language. So Let's see how much time we have here, a few more minutes. So here's another case. This is an 83 year old um, with AFib on Xarelto. She also developed aphasia, right sided weakness at about 4 p.m. Um, so it makes you think of probably the same thing, probably ICA or probably left M1. She had a stroke scale of 19, which, as I was mentioning, is moderate. This is a little worse. She's probably unconscious, not communicating. CT was negative for hemorrhage. She got IV TPA. And <clears throat> I'm showing you this because it shows the other device that we can use. The recommendation is to use a stent retriever, actually, from the new guidelines. But a lot of people are, instead of using a stent retriever, they're trying first with a suction catheter. If that works, if that doesn't work, then they go to a stent retriever. We're actually the main site on a uh, multi-center trial to compare the two techniques, and that's about half enrolled at this point. So this is just a suction catheter, and this, the way this works is you bring it up and you put it right on the back of the clot and um, activate the suction, let it sit for a few minutes, and it kind of corks on. And because you're not deploying the stent retriever, you have fewer devices, you can actually get a little bit faster recanalization time. So just to give you an idea of how long these procedures take, they're really just a few minutes. This procedure was from, from groin puncture to the time that it's fully recanalized. It was only 12 minutes. Here's, a, here's an example of a posterior circulation. Stuff like this is harder to recognize because it's not the classic focal symptoms. So it might be harder for you to recognize as a patient's waking up. The symptoms here are <clears throat> patients just not really waking up that well so um, and, and remain sleepy without any anesthesia on board. 
the thing that is, is usually a giveaway for basilar is that you might have some ocular findings. Um, and if you have some cranial nerve findings, then that might urge you to call a stroke code. Um, so this is a 61-year-old female. She woke up with symptoms, so we don't know the exact time period. So we might have to do some other studies to figure out if she's eligible. She's brought into EMS, brought in by EMS. Her stroke, her stroke scale was 22. She was unable to respond, unable to answer questions, uh, and did not blink to threat. So maybe that was a brainstem reflex problem. Um, her CT showed a hyperdense basilar artery, like we we're talking about with the hyperdense MCA. She was intubated, transferred here, and um, we used a suction catheter and put it right up to the clot, and we were able to reperfuse by sucking the clot right out, and it corked onto the end of the um, suction catheter like that, and it came out easily. Here's another one that should, gives you an example of the imaging that we use. This patient woke up. Oh, let's go to this one. 65-year-old woman with hypertension uh, who smokes, who works out a lot, rank and score, so she's normal at baseline. She was last known well the day prior at 10.30 p.m., and she came in at 10 a.m., so that's 11 and a half hours. She had aphasia, right hemiplegia, usual story, clearly localizes to the left side. Um, so she got her studies, the CT and the CTA. Um, we, knew, we saw that there was a left ICA occlusion, and the CT looked pretty good. So <clears throat> what we did here is we did a CT perfusion, and here we can see that there's a mismatch where you see I won't go into the details of, of how it's a little bit complex there, but you basically can see that there's some tissue that is uh, poorly perfused but not yet ischemic. And then uh, using a stent we were able to reperfuse that. And uh, her stroke scale improved. Um, really, even post update one, she'd improved from stroke scale of 16 to 6. So, just to, that's, <clears throat> it's, all, it's really all about timing. And so the time window that we now use is six hours. If it's within six hours, then we don't need the CT perfusion. But if it's between six hours and, and really any, any time point after that, one trial is out to 24, one trial is out to 16, and one trial is out to 12. And those are active and ongoing. So the conclusions are time is brain. Um, the time, once you see a focal deficit, you really have to act quickly. Technology is improving, so we can pretty much treat almost any clot. And then um, for patients with large vessel occlusion and a penumbral target, we can expand the time window. Uh, this has become the new standard of care. And um, so now we're triaging patients here from multiple different hospitals. These are all the hospitals that we communicate with directly around the city um, using social media and uh, group texting That's uh, to try and coordinate care between the ER doctors in these hospitals, the neurology team here. It's really a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary effort to get the patients to, the, uh, to get evaluated, see if they're a candidate, and get them to the uh, catheter lab as quickly as possible. So take home points are <clears throat> the official time window is six hours. But if a patient wakes up from a prolonged surgery, there are other things we can do even out to, for a trial, out to 16 hours, out to 24 hours. But depending on how the patient's doing, it's still worth getting a CT, CT perfusion. T and while TPA has many exclusion criteria, the endovascular thrombectomy doesn't. There's no upper age limit. We did treat a 104-year-old who did well. So, and then the most important thing is time. Well, thank you guys so much for coming down today. And, and again, thank you.